Good morning. My name is Laurel Baer, and um, I'm a consultant for Department of Mental Health. But prior to that, for 38 years, I was within the Alhambra School District. And I retired from the district this past May as Assistant Superintendent of Student Employee Welfare. Hi, I'm Sandra Black. I am with um, Each Mind Matters. I'm a suicide prevention consultant. And um, prior to that, I did a lot of work at the State Department of Mental Health with the Office of Suicide Prevention and the Statewide Strategic Plan. And yeah, that's about it. So we welcome you um, on a very important topic that oftentimes is left out of a number of different activities and plans within your school community. But before we get started, we wanted to see who's in the audience this morning. And so if I could ask how many of you are in the field of education? Okay, a large majority. And then behavioral health agencies? Thank you. And providers? And consumers, families, or others? Okay. Others? <laughs> others. Okay. You're in a category all by itself. <laughs> and so as you think through postvention, and I'm speaking from the educational arena, and then definitely we'll look at delivery of services, and we look at oftentimes our school safety plans, our crisis response plans, we leave out postvention. And so when you think through your experiences, how many of you have had an experience and had to respond to um, somebody that has died by suicide? The majority of you. And if you're newer into the field, um, the reality is that it's unfortunate to say, but it's not a matter of if, most likely it's a matter of when. And so when we look at our postvention plan, it's an intricate part of our response not only to respond after a death caused by suicide, but also we use it as a prevention model. So for those of you that have been placed in a situation in which you've needed to respond, what has helped you? If you could share out with the group, what has helped you? Mr. Lieberman, yes. Well, having resources. Absolutely. So um, I think it's essential that every principal in America have a copy of the After a Suicide Toolkit to help guide them on the morning. Absolutely. So if you have not been able to look that up or refer to that, having those resources in school communities, we often work in silos. And so we're afraid to reach out or ask for help. And this probably of any other topic is an area that we need to reach out and say, you know what, I need help. I need support because that increases capacity and we can't do that alone. Maybe one or two other thoughts? A little basic psychoeducation. What is suicide? What is a suicidal thought? What are thoughts? Is something that most people aren't aware of until something bad happens. Yeah. And uh, so psychoeducation. Psychoeducation. AB 2246 has put into place some stipulated criteria, but that's just scratching the surface. And so we have to dig a lot deeper so that we're making sure that this is integrated into our, we call it school community um, because we're not just uh, responding as a school district or as a community, but we're bringing those forces together. Perhaps one other thought? Talking to people about the situation and also listening to others affected by it. Absolutely, so that active listening um, because in the fields that we're in, we're fixers. And so we can't always respond in that matter. And so as we look at that, what perhaps would have helped you? I was going to say we um, rallying around our colleague that was directly affected by it. So not only supporting the students, but also supporting our colleagues. Such an important piece um, that we need to re re make sure that we engage in self-care. And we're going to talk about that later in the presentation and how we take care of each other, and we heard that in this morning's platform, but that's something that we want to make sure we message continuously, and not just helping our colleagues, but helping ourselves, because oftentimes we put ourselves way back in the list of priorities. Absolutely. One other thought? So that gives you a little bit of insight. This is a very complex um, area, and it requires many layers, and we don't have all the answers in 90 minutes, but definitely we're going to do our best to get you as much information as we need. So when we look at that, if we can look at today's agenda, 
it's pretty concretized here. We want to make sure that um, we're able to talk about what happens after a death by suicide and how as a school community we're able to respond to that and that talking about postvention is critically important. So as you leave and go back to your school communities and you look at your school safety plans, you look at your board policies, you look at your administrative regs, that you really look at what are you going to do differently in the event you need to respond to postvention. And so we want to make sure that you're able to leave with tools and there's handouts that were provided. If you haven't picked those up on the back table, it gives you a list of a number of resources and opportunities that you're able to reach out. And we also want to talk about best practices and best practices where they present today. And we know it's ever evolving and it's going to change continuously. But to be a part of these committees, to be a part of looking at your community and those wealth of resources, that if you're within the community, reaching back out to the schools, if you're within the districts, reaching out to the community and really thinking outside the box and looking at those opportunities of police and fire chaplains and looking at the faith community and looking at those local agencies and understanding that you've got a whole team to rally around you and you're not doing this by yourself. And then to make sure that as a community, you construct a postvention plan. And it needs to be pretty specific, but flexible, similar to what we say with your crisis response plan. And as we begin to look at these, and you're going to see some repetition with a number of different diagrams because we all gather our information from the same areas. And so we want to make sure that you understand that postvention is extremely important for those survivors. And so as we look at that, oftentimes I know in a school community, we're going to triage those most directly impacted. But we cannot solely concentrate on those directly impacted. We need to go out because oftentimes this event will impact others that are off our radar. And so as you begin to set up your plan, you need to look at do you have the capacity to be able to respond? Because you're not only responding to those directly involved, those that have direct relationships, but those at-risk behaviors. AB 2246 identifies those very vulnerable populations on your campuses, your foster youth, your homeless youth, your special ed youth, your LGBTQ, but you want to make sure that you're mindful as you're creating your postvention plan that you've taken into account all these additional areas. And this is a familiar puzzle. So I didn't see Sandra won the presentation, but I'm thinking they stole our puzzle, but we stole yeah, theirs no, we as stole well. <laughs> um, because it's um, available to all of you. And it really is a matter of looking at where do those pieces fit. And when we look at postvention, we know that it's extremely important to have a comprehensive approach. And that it's not simple. And somebody communicated that when we started this morning is that it's very complex. And we can provide all the psychoeducation that we have available to us. It's still very complex. And so we know that we have to constantly make sure that we're messaging, that we're communicating. You know, school districts, I've been in this field for 38 years. In school districts, you know, 12 years ago, we didn't talk about mental health, yet alone about suicide. And I remember sneaking clinicians through the back door when I was a principal because I knew kids needed additional support, but I didn't know how to access that in an appropriate way. Now we've evolved if we look at 2018 and we're talking about that, but the behavior is still increasing in numbers. And so we have to look at what we are doing differently and we have to take these pieces and we need to make sure that we triage with our response, but we bring these puzzles together that we're communicating effectively, that we're working with our partners and our experts, that everybody has a hand in it. That's why the um, venue for this particular conference is so critically important, because alone we are not nearly as effective as we are together as a collaborative. And so as you see the different fields coming together, because who would have thought we would have police sitting in a suicide prevention? And so we're seeing that everybody needs to have this information. If we're going to truly respond, we're going to need to be able to respond together. And so if we look at what our goals are in the workshop, we're looking at how do we support and heal. And there is a process that's involved with that. Offer support to each other. So somebody said taking care of our colleagues, but taking care of ourselves as well. And being able to respond promptly and appropriately to put together a postvention plan on the fly or when a circumstance occurs, it's not going to be nearly as effective as it is if you plan ahead of time. Just like you plan your crisis response and you know how you're going to gather the troops and you know how you're going to respond and if you're working with community members, have they been cross-trained and if we're working with police departments, have they been cross-trained so that your response is united 
it's consistent, um, and it's supportive of each other. And then how do we educate the community? Because educating after a death by suicide is not um, the most appropriate response. And so how do you continuously message that? And in our community, what we did is we talk about good mental health on every platform, at parent universities, at Saturday schools, at parent project. We talk about how to keep our kids safe. And that's safe from all the way from relationships to drug and alcohol to mental health. And so it becomes a commonality and it becomes a, a more comfortable venue. Because these are difficult conversations to have. And then you need to take into account in Los Angeles County our demographics. And those in themselves are extremely challenging as well. And so we have to look at that cultural competency is far more than translation. And so we have to make sure that we're responsible and we're responsive to that. So before I start going into some of this, I wanted to, um, Laura has talked a lot about school communities and the educational system, um, and the sort of piece I'm bringing into it is, is the larger community. So a lot of you work in, in a school or with students. Do, do you all live somewhere? Do you have friends, family? Okay. That's good to know because 70% of people who die by suicide are working age adults. They're not students. So we really also need to think about where we live, where we work, um, even if it's not in the school. I think the school is a, a great place to start and a lot of progress has been made. Um, the, the After a Suicide Toolkit, for example. Um, but in my work working with counties around California, I, um, I've been approached, asked about how do we do this in our community, and we were not able to find a similar resource. So um, my colleague, Anara Gard, who's doing another presentation right now, and I did this community postvention response guide. Um, we worked intensively with the Tahoe Truckee Suicide Prevention Coalition to develop a plan for their community, and then we sort of generalized it. And it's after rural suicide, so it's really oriented around smaller communities, but very applicable. So we really looked at what the, what the best practices would be and um, developed this, um, this guide, and that's what is going to... Um, you know, and we also looked at the after a suicide toolkit as well. But as Laura will continue to explain throughout, um, the school community is specific and different than a general community. So um, what you're getting is things on both of those levels here. So um, surviving suicide loss, um, you know, the effects of suicide. I think most of you raised your hand and said you've been affected by a suicide. So certainly the immediate impact of friends, family, maybe witnesses, anyone directly around the person who died. But the effects of a suicide can really ripple out completely to whole communities, depending on the circumstances. And sometimes those effects are not defined by your relationship to the person. You can be very highly impacted by a suicide death from someone that you don't know or that you didn't know very well. So it's important to keep that in mind when we're thinking about planning to planning support for survivors. We're not just thinking about the immediate family, the immediate people in, in the immediate vicinity of that person, but potentially thinking out toward whole communities. And the uh, presentations this morning were be beautiful in talking about what we call complicated grief. So as Stan said this morning, you're not only mourning the loss of someone, you're mourning the loss of someone to suicide. And the fact that suicide was the cause of death can introduce a lot of other emotions that are very challenging. Shame, blame, guilt, should I have done more? I'm intensely angry, angry. I feel abandoned. Um, shock and disbelief are very common um, reactions, sometimes even an element of relief, especially if the person who died had been struggling for a long time with various issues. It can feel a little, there's an element of relief that's super uncomfortable, but we have to name it. It can be there. And again, the fear that others, you're going to lose other people, the fear that other people might also go on to die by suicide. And a lot of these things, it's a very complicated issue, but survivors of suicide loss can at themselves be at, at increased risk of suicide. Um, this is a picture of the Hemingway family. How many of you heard about the Hemingway, the great Hemingway analogy, or not analogy, but um, this is uh, Ernest Hemingway, the writer. Um, he is right here, the little page boy haircut. Four of the six people in this family photo went on to die by suicide, the father and three of the siblings. 
So we bring that up because it's not like an inherited gene exactly, anything like that, but Mariel Hemingway, who is a granddaughter of Ernest Hemingway, um, her sister died by suicide. Um, again, in subsequent generations, the effects of suicide continue to be felt. She's a, a mental health advocate now, and she talks about how the concept of, you know, mental health and substance abuse issues were common in the family. The idea of suicide was almost like normal. This is how we, this is how we do. And that she has had to, in her life and in her life as a mother, to uh, consciously counter the effects of the knowledge of that family history very consciously counteract those effects and, and really um, change how they think about um, suicide and mental health in their family. Contagion is the process by which, by which one suicide death may contribute to another. It's relatively rare. In general, we consider adolescents and young adults to be more vulnerable to this because of the ways that young people often very intensely identify with peers. And contagion, the con contagion can be, the risk of contagion can be increased in various ways. How a death is portrayed and talked about just amongst people in social media, in the news media, all of these things have the potential to help or harm after a suicide. And within schools, it adds a whole level of complexity, so it's not necessarily as rare. So we need to be very yeah. mindful of that um, when you're responding and how you talk about it with the students because students will know. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of how you're going to be able to talk about it as honestly as you can, but also you've got the whole FERPA matter and you're bringing in all these other variables. So it's important to recognize that um, there is a process there and, um, and we do see that and it becomes very serious on our school campuses. I was gonna say contagion today is in a whole different new ballpark Absolutely. as a result of social media. Absolutely. Absolutely. True. Uh, so more vulnerability. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. your comment that it's rare. Relatively, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, in and around yeah. schools and in and around Facebook and Insta pot, what, or Instagram. <laughs> Insta pot. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever there. Sorry, I got my shows mixed up. <laughs> I got my shows mixed so, up. So as we talk about that in the schools and we talk about it, even if the family has not necessarily given us permission, and when we go into crisis response, and we'll talk a little bit about this at the end, but we'll say to the students, well, what did you hear? Because there has to be a level of acknowledgement within the schools without necessarily violating that disclosure. So there's that whole complexity, and Sandra said, we go back and forth, and even in our phone conferences, we spent a lot of time because there are similarities, but there are significant differences. Yeah, thank you. So um, supporting survivors, reducing the risk of contagion, two of the biggest goals of postvention. Um, so when we talk about contagion um, in the media, we used to talk about Marilyn Monroe. You all heard about that old. Well, un unfortunately, we have a more recent event. Um, when Robin Williams died, there was a documented increase in the number of suicides among men in their middle years using the same method the actor used. The, me the, actor, the, me the, actor, the method the actor used is not the most common method, typically, so it's an unusual trend. And this was found in, in the year or so after his death. Um, I don't know if you all remember the media coverage after Robin Williams' suicide. It was pervasive and graphically detailed about how he did it, the scene, everything. You could picture it in your mind. That's extremely dangerous to someone who's in a vulnerable position. But the good news is that something else happened after Robin Williams died, which is that by that time, as a field, we had moved forward with the recommendations for reporting on suicide, and they were being disseminated widely. We also have this um, wonderful thing called the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and it was really promoted pretty good in those media stories, actually. A lot of people learned about that resource and used it. So there was a tremendous bump in calls to the Lifeline again, within especially the first few months, but they have continued to have a higher baseline of call volume to the lifeline than they had prior to Robin Williams' death, and they believe it has to do directly with how widely that was promoted. So that tells us that, the again, media coverage, which is also a proxy for how we talk about suicide and what we say, has a tremendous impact on people who are vulnerable and hurting after the fact. 
If you provide a resource, people can be helped. If you talk graphically about the death and focus on that, that can harm. And that's also the case with how we talk about it within, within communities as well, and especially, I imagine, in school communities. Could I interject? Yeah. Just a personal experience uh, dealing with Robin Williams. Uh, the, I was at a Chamber of Commerce luncheon at a table with 10 people sitting there, business people, and somebody started talking about Robin Williams' suicide and uh, how that was such a horrible, selfish thing to do to his family. And uh, so because of my own personal experience, I was able to share with that table of business people what it feels like to live with suicidal ideation uh, since even a young child and the thoughts that go through your brain yeah. as you're having these suicidal thoughts and that it has absolutely nothing to do with selfishness because you always feel that everyone <coughs> will be so much happier and better off when you're gone. Yeah. And so in addition to getting people that are feeling uh, suicidal or self-harming to reach out for help, it was also a opportunity to talk about it in the community in a more open way and share information. Thank you for that because I think that's a, a prime example of how we talk about suicide after a death and, and how that's an opportunity for the education. It's not so much like, oh, know the signs, but it can be about um, just talking about what is complicated grief? What was that person feeling? Maybe it would be healing to understand that that person wasn't doing this terrible selfish <clears throat> act, but that, because that makes it feel like they inflicted it upon everybody else. Like they had me in mind when they did that, but probably not in the way you were thinking. So it's an opportunity to educate for sure. And I think as Stan and some of the other speakers said this morning, um, the fear of saying the wrong thing and the fear of doing the wrong thing we must learn what is the right thing to do or what is a helpful thing to do rather than think that way because if we do, we could be silent and inactive when in the aftermath of a suicide is the time when people really need to hear what you have to say. So what helps after suicide? How many of you have been in a situation where you had to respond but you weren't quite sure what to do? Yeah, I would say, you know, most people don't have a postvention plan where they work and where they live. I can tell you. Um, if you have one, let me know. Come up and tell me. I want to see it and show it and share it with others because that's why we're doing this work. Um, most of the time, we're kind of just hoping it won't happen again. But an organized, quick, and empathic response is very helpful after a suicide. People hear positive messages of help and hope and it's mobilized to the places where people are most impacted by the loss, and it all happens very quickly and in an organized manner. Support is available to those affected, so having survivor-specific support services that are available to people who are impacted. And, and on the flip side of that, when you look at schools, because there is that response where students end up in more crises if they're already in crisis, is the additional assessment. So you're looking at responding to the loss by suicide as well as those kids that are ter terribly at risk for perhaps having to be placed on a hold or having to make sure that we're rallying behind them and providing them the necessary support. So that's why encompassing the entire community so that you're able to respond to these multiple needs is extremely important. Yeah. So, yes. So this intervention uh, after a suicide in an organized way is typically uh, covering a period of time. And in my experience, the, the time period of the support response has not been long enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, abs thank you. Good point. As we've been talking about how, how the suicide is handled by the school, the community, the workplace, the places most impacted, and how it's portrayed publicly, talked about in social media, publicly, social media, the news media, um, how it's handled publicly, can talked I, about. Can I ask a quick question mm -hmm. about, because um, I don't know if this is a good time or later on, I don't want to miss my chance to, to, to get some clarity around this. So about talking to parents, so I've only done one postvention after a suicide in the school, and my job was to talk to parents, and that was really tricky. So I'd like to hear from you, this is, a great for me as an MSW who has uh, subject matter expertise for many years. So how would you handle it when a parent said, what they said to me was, um, 
uh, I only know two things about suicide. It was something like this. I only know two things. You can't talk about suicide. And if you do talk about suicide, you can catch it. Oh, yeah. So, and with this whole <laughs> contagion thing, there's all, I always hear people, it, the answer to contagion I've heard is always yes and no. Contagiousness of suicide, it's not, but it kind of is. So, how would you talk to a parent who comes up to you and asks what they asked me, which really stumped me? Um, I could answer the first part a little bit. You know, you can't talk about suicide. Okay, it's not the S word anymore, it's suicide. But how, do you, how would you answer that? About um, if you do talk about suicide, you can catch it, and I don't want to talk to my kid about it because I don't want to make it worse. In, in two seconds, please, give me a <laughs> two seconds, Laurel. So it's not a two-second response. So definitely we can talk through that, and we talk a little bit about that at the end, but talking about it is not going to increase the act, um, most importantly, and so you need to be very authentic and very direct with that. And then provide resources. I always say that you leverage a tragedy with an opportunity to make change. And so you need to begin to talk about what resources are available, what's within the community, what do you have within the community or on a school campus or within the faith community, and you really have these candid conversations. And if there are not those resources that you're aware of, that you know what, I am unsure, let me look into that and follow back up. Because simply not talking about that squashes that opportunity to have those thoughtful, meaningful conversations. So I know it's much more complex than that, but I say that any time you have an opportunity to educate and communicate, go for it, because those opportunities don't present themselves often. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll get into that a little mm -hmm. bit more, but it's definitely communication is key afterward. It's, it's, it's how you communicate that's important, and not communicating is an option that is not very effective, because people are talking about it. And as we heard this morning from people with lived experience, the opportunity to talk about it in safely with, in a safe environment was what turned everything around for them. Mm -hmm. so. And if you're not sure, I always say, if we're not sure what to say, simply say to those individuals, how can I help? Always an opportunity to talk about help. Yep. Yeah. How can I help? Right. You know, or to kids, oftentimes we're going to say, where do you hurt? You know, those are two simple questions that are not terribly threatening. If you're not quite sure how to gather that information or you don't know the individuals, that's always a good place to start. And allow time to take place. So that silence is okay silence. And so we say you can't rush the process. It's going to take time to evolve. Yeah, thank you. So getting back to the postvention plan, I think this is the approach most of us like to have which is if I just you know, put my head in my shell me in, and let the, the, the storm pass, maybe it won't happen again. But as Laurel said earlier, it's not so much if, but when, in most cases. It, hopefully a long time, but maybe not. So better to have your plan in place ahead of time rather than be like this guy. And that is not to denigrate turtles, because I think they're wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to shift into now are what are the elements of a postvention plan. Um, and they include all of the things that you see in this circle, the support for lost survivors, um, activities that help to reduce the trauma that is felt by survivors, witnesses, others impacted by the death, timely and accurate sharing of information among key individuals for specific purposes the appropriate responses, um, prevention messaging and education, again, in an appropriate time and manner, and an annual review to learn and improve the postvention plan, as well as to feed it back into the prevention strategies of the community that you're serving. So developing a postvention plan, um, you know, this morning, they, again, talking about you know what you want, then you bring in the people to help you do it. So, you know, you figure out what community you're going to be serving. Is it the school? Is it the workplace? Is it your county, a whole community, a region? Um, and you engage the key stakeholders who are involved in that, in suicide postvention in that community. Whether or not there's a plan, there is some kind of a response. And there are people who are involved in that response. And then there are people who need to be involved in the response. And those are the ones that are gathered. The next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, getting, gathering some information, establishing a core team, inventorying the services and supports, and a plan for public communication. We're going to break this down. So this is not an exhaustive list of key stakeholders. It's not a minimum list. But it's a, a list of common stakeholders. Um, 
first of all, coroner and law enforcement, we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, um, behavioral health, both public and private providers, anyone who might be a network of support, um, crisis centers, if you're lucky enough to have one, which you are here, uh, lost survivors, absolutely the voice of experience, um, as well as attempt survivors, if that's accessible to you, I think that would be super helpful. Schools, chaplains and clergy, funeral directors and chapels, um, again, who are often on the front lines of dealing with those in the aftermath of a suicide. Um, primary care, hospital, emergency rooms, um, and then culturally diverse community leaders, uh, depending on which communities are, are within the one that you're going to be serving with this plan. And it was no accident that in that sort of example list that the first responders, who we are re meaning law enforcement and the coroner typically, they need to be engaged and fully participating. And that's primarily because in most cases, they are the first on the scene. That's who gets called. Within our school districts, it's also important to have their presence at your school sites. So to the extent possible, we have what we call partnership meetings. And we've run those for years and years and years. And those are oftentimes also, although we meet monthly on a variety of different topics, those are our first responders. So when there is an aftermath of death by suicide, we call upon them because they bring a sense of calmness to the school campus, a sense of security and safety. They're able to work with staff and help you engage in self-care. Um, and that's not only our chaplains, but that's our school resource officers. And so they walk the halls. They make sure they're out on the fields. They go into the restrooms. They go into the offices so that there is a very visible presence. So when you begin to look at your community of stakeholders that you can tap into those resources, those are tremendous resources because they'll provide respite for those that are providing immediate care and response to those that need that therapeutic service. Yeah. So um, they, they, yes, and they are the primary source of accurate and timely information that a death has occurred. Um, and in, in some cases, law, depending on your relationship with law enforcement, um, where you start and what their role is exactly, can, it can vary. Um, but they need to be involved. There's, there's really, a, a, to your best efforts, um, and in many cases, that law enforcement will welcome this as a way to augment their work because they, they have a job to do at the scene and with the family and, and knowing that they're sort of a nice warm handoff to a postvention team um, is a way for them to, to make sure that the family, the witnesses, the survivors are, are being taken care of while they do their job. Law enforcement chaplains often find themselves in that position. So if law enforcement chaplains are active in this, they're often called with law enforcement to the scene to help work with the witnesses or survivors. So um, they clearly need to be involved with what you're developing. Sometimes formal agreements might be needed for this. Sometimes it can be informal. It just depends on what your relationship is. They're a great bridge for school communities because oftentimes in school districts, we think either it's the mental health agencies or the private practitioners, perhaps, if you've got MOUs with them. But if you look at your local law enforcement, your police chaplains, your fire chaplains, those are additional resources that we don't tap into on a regular basis yeah. within the school community. Yeah. So once you're starting to do it, yes. I just, I work for the city of LA. We have a mayor's crisis response team. And we have a very great relationship with LAUSD. Um, so that we are the we are on scene, and then we contact LAUSD, and then it's very fluid. But what we don't have are good relationships with um, non LAUSD charter schools. There some were seventy nine other districts, right? And, and yeah. some because we deal with deaths that occur in the city, and a lot of those folks go to school in the marina, right? Mm -hmm. So I would love after. If you guys want to be connected directly to the crisis response team, I would love to be connected to you guys. Mm -hmm. But we consider ourselves part of the first responders. Um, and the police call us in because they're not always comfortable mm -hmm. Good. dealing with it. And so it's, um, I think LA ha has a really great model that way. And so anybody who wants to be connected directly to some first responders. Please. And then if you look at the smaller jurisdictions, they don't have, unfortunately, the resources that LA has but there's still a process to go through. And so being able to develop those really authentic relationships with your local sheriffs or police department, 
You know, you don't know when you need them until you need them, and you don't recognize the value until you have to call upon them. So similar to what is being described with LAUSD at a much smaller scale, is certainly available, and we cross-train. So look at how do you cross-train with your local police department. You know, I was back in Washington last year, and it was a school resource officer conference. We trained over 1,000 school resource officers on just suicide prevention. And they're hungry for that information. And so oftentimes they come in, no, it didn't meet the criteria, and they're off. And you're thinking, yes, it does. This child's tremendously at risk. So that cross-training, that collaboration, that assessment together where they can take secondary information, they don't have to hear it directly, is very different and extremely important when we're keeping our kids safe. So yes, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to add, I'm actually with LAUSD, and this year uh, we developed uh, mental health evaluation teams within our school district. So our psychiatric social workers are now partnering and writing along with our school police officers to respond to um, assessing students at school. And this is the first time ever that this is being rolled out, so it's really exciting that we have that partnership with law enforcement. And your smaller communities have the MET teams as well, the mental health teams that ride along, and so they'll respond to the community, they'll respond to schools, they'll respond to businesses. Um, but again, the resources are tapped. So we can't say, well, we don't need it because we just have them to respond because that's perhaps one MET team for an entire city. And so we have to look at how do we increase that capacity, but thank you. Yeah, so all of that stuff is, is part of this information gathering process. So um, again, you know, the basic information is what suicide looks like in the community that you're hoping the plan will serve. Um, that includes data, some of the data that Ellie talked about this morning, <clears throat> deaths and attempts, lots of sources of data for that, really looking at that carefully, as well as, um, you know, any other circumstances surrounding those deaths that can be informative about um, where there are opportunities for postvention, um, and then what is not happening that should be happening after deaths in those communities. Um, where are the linkages? Where are models and partners that, that may already be doing something like this? Um, LAUSD maybe sharing with the charter schools, doing more of a partnership there. Um, looking at, at similar types of plans that might, might not be a suicide postvention plan, but that could be a good model to base your postvention response on. Existing crisis plans that can be modified to include a postvention capacity. All of this process, um, as well as understanding what lost survivors currently experience. So sometimes we can you know, get busy talking to our agency partners and get busy looking at data and forget about the, the voice of the lived experience and understanding what is the typical trajectory, what was offered, what, what, what did help you, and what would have helped you. Um, much more qualitative input. And that also goes for first responders, others who are key in a postvention response. What typically happens? How, how are you typically involved? What are the sequence of events? And what would help you feel like you're um, responding more effectively? So um, in this model, we talk about establishing a core team. And core team is just a term. Um, it can be called any number of different things, but um, the core team is a small group of trusted individuals who are the key drivers of the whole postvention response. So they are identified individuals, and they become the primary contact with the first responders, the public, the public and any others impacted by the death. They are the go-to people. They um, coordinate and facilitate all of the response steps, which doesn't mean they implement every piece of it necessarily, but they make sure that the things are happening, that the, the different key partners who are going to be involved are notified and um, put into action. They connect, they help to connect the lost survivors with services and supports, either directly or just ensuring that they received the information about what's available to help, not only in the immediate aftermath, but over time over a lot of time. If you've ever had lost a, a, a loved one to suicide, you know there's a lot to deal with in the immediate aftermath. It may not be the time for you to engage in survivor support. Um, it can take a while to be in a place where that's something that you want. Uh, monitoring the risk of contagion and what level of postvention response might be appropriate. In many cases, um, there's a a few steps that are taken afterward. In other cases, you may want to take some broader steps, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
Um, it, coordinating with a suicide prevention coalition, which hopefully there is one that serves the community you're talking about and other key partners. And this is not communicating every detail about the death or so on, but just keeping them informed that, you know, this is happening, we're moving forward, um, and, and tapping into the members of that coalition for help with parts of the postvention responses needed. And as Laurel's gonna talk a little bit more later about this, but definitely having a process for debriefing among these core team members, very intense work. Um, often the people who serve on the core team, especially if we're talking about a large community with a lot of suicide deaths, this could be a big focus of what they do and it's intense. So they definitely need a process for debriefing and self-care. And from a school community, if you're looking at your primary contact, making sure that that primary contact within the school community has those relationships with local jurisdictions such as police, such as sheriff's department, so that whether it's during the school day when you're notified or after the school day or on the weekends, the more time that you're able to set up your postvention, um, the more effective that will be and the more organized it will be. So again, forming those relationships in the event of a crisis is not the recommended way to form relationships. Having those relationships evolve over a period of time so in the event there is a crisis, you're able to respond more effectively and more collaboratively as a way to evolve. So if you leave here and say, you know what, I don't know who my contact would be with my local city police department or my sheriff's department, that may be one task that you walk away with in trying to develop your postvention plan. So one of the issues I want to point out specifically, it's, it's been a little bit of a sticky issue in this process, um, is this idea of timely notification of a death. So what the model is recommending as an ideal is that law enforcement first responders automatically notify your core team of each and every death that happens in the community served right away. So they let you know the basic details about the death and then the, you as the core team members determine what the appropriate next steps are and see it through for every single one. And so ideally, you know, within 24 hours of a death, you know about it, you know the basic details, you can put the postvention plan into place. Um, it's not necessary to be on call 24 seven, but in most cases, you're learning about it within a very short window. Um, if in your community that's a little out of reach, law enforcement aren't always entirely comfortable with that right away. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, but if that's not entirely within reach, you still can develop your postvention plan and launch it from whenever you do learn about the death. Just verify what you've heard. If you're hearing about it through the rumor mills or informally, um, verify as much as you can. Much of the information that you would need and that you're hoping law enforcement will share with you directly is, pu is ultimately public information. It's not, you're not asking for anything super private, um, but they can be reluctant to share right away. So it's just one of these things, one of the reasons why they, law enforcement are among the first you engage and start hammering out the relationships, the agreements, the understandings, why your core team is a small group of trusted individuals. Law enforcement understands why you are one of those, they're, they're the, the need to know guys, right? I'll tell you what you need to know. This is why I need to know it to do this. And once they understand that, maybe they're willing to share it with you. And automatically is good. In many cases, law enforcement will reach out to um, experts who do this work um, when they feel like it's something that might need that. And they have a pretty good gauge of that. But I think if you can develop a relationship where they trust you enough to let you be the one that decides that, that's that's better because ultimately your core team are the experts. With schools, oftentimes you may not be notified until the family or mm. the kids come to school the next day, which is very difficult to be able to set up that postvention and response team. So that's why those relationships that Sandra's speaking to are so critically important. I know in our community, we were notified literally upon the response to the, the home. And then that way they gave us plenty of time to be able to set up that postvention, to collaborate with law enforcement and the chaplains, to go to the home so we had a better understanding of what they wished for us to disseminate or communicate, if they identified any friends or peers that were at risk. And so we were able to evolve that triage response, which looks a little different than the community response, but also we have to take into mind that we're obligated to adhere to FERPA, 
Mm -hmm. And so there is a yeah. privacy, a very restrictive privacy when it comes to disclosure. And so we work through with the family and then you take into all the other variables as far as where they're at in order to make those decisions or not make those decisions. And if siblings are involved and relatives and, you know, it's very complicated. And then we look at prior schools that that individual perhaps attended. So you have to really look at how, the, how to respond with that scaffolding effect. That used to work very well with the mayor's team as well. Yeah. In the early days, there was excellent communication with the psychological services of the school district. Right. Uh, so that there was a heads up. I know that you did a wonderful job in Alhambra in, in collaborating. It, it really gives you a head start. You can reach out to the principals. You can reach out to the families. Um, so it, it's very valuable. But we're talking about LA County of 80 school districts. There's, virtually 80 different ways we can achieve the, this collaboration. It's worth the effort. It is. Mm -hmm. So one of the next steps is, again, before you start uh, out your postvention response, you need to know exactly what resources are available to support those survivors. And I think in this area you have a lot. Um, so the key, the key activity is to create some kind of an inventory of what those are and make them as many broad different options as you can. Um, survivors are not, a, 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 you know, mo most survivors will benefit from interacting with others who have had the same loss. They find that very helpful. Um, but it, it may not always be in the same way. Going to a group is not for everybody. And that's not because there's any deficiency in those people. It's just because it's not for everybody. Um, so uh, there's a survivor support program up in Sacramento called Friends for Survival, who we've done a lot of work with. And one of the nice things about Friends for Survival is they have groups in various communities around Northern California, face-to-face -face groups, but they have also developed other venues that are helpful to survivors that include um, newsletters that are mailed out, online stuff, um, a helpline. So as much of a range of services and supports as you can that are specific to survivors of suicide loss. Um, in a lot of the communities we've worked with, um, there's a desire to include things that you should be con consider carefully. Like, um, you know, there are a lot of bereavement support groups and loss support groups. Many survivors of suicide loss group report feeling uncomfortable in those groups. It's just that there's a lot of um, complications associated with it. And I think that, um, you know, they don't always feel as supported in those groups. So really finding stuff that's specific to lost survivors, finding counselors and providers who are experienced in um, counseling people after that, a range of services and supports. And then creating some kind of um, a brochure. This is a, a template of a brochure here um, that simply communicates a message of hope and then lists what's available to help and um, providing a supply of those, and, and also having a card. So something as small as a, a little card that has a brief message of hope and a contact for your core team member who can be in a position to help mobilize those supports. And then what you're doing is having those provided in supply to your first responders who are going out on scenes. And then when they you know, come to the scene uh, or they come to um, inf notify the family or what have you, they, they can hand that off. And it's just a, an immediate way for you to get that information forward. But it's also important to have it in other venues as well. So uh, sharing it with people in emergency departments, with funeral chaplains, anywhere that you think someone might come into contact with it. Again, because the immediate aftermath is not always the best time to receive the information. You want to have different ways to get it out in waves. And also having it on a website is really helpful because people might find it that way more readily than a piece of paper. So a little bit about, we, we talked a lot about this this morning in this conference, which is great. Um, so you guys are, are totally on board. Um, but I think this idea that if you talk about it, um, you're going to cause it, or it's just, it's just uncomfortable to talk about it. And in a lot of environments, there's a desire to be hush-hush about, oh, they committed suicide. You know, and, and it's, it's a painful and sensitive subject. And because of all of those different emotions that are associated with it, um, people aren't quite sure what to say, and it can lead to saying nothing. And so the important thing to, the most important thing to know is that it's not so much about saying the wrong thing, 
is it is about knowing that this is the time to communicate that message of help and hope, for sure. People need to hear it. Um, I just had a, a call just before I came down here from one of my counties who's just launching all of these big suicide prevention awareness week activities, and then they had a really tragic um, event in their community just yesterday or the day before she called me and it was impact impactful on every level and she was not sure how to, how to go forward with her message and her colleagues were suggesting that now's not the time just don't do the stuff and I would say no now is the time you are just changing your message a little bit to focusing on the resources to help people need to know that there's a way there's help out there now more than ever so there's rarely a time when silence is the right response for this. But there are some guidelines that are out there for um, how to talk about suicide in general and, and some thoughts about suicide, talking about suicide after a death. Um, when what you want to have in your postvention plan is, is a communication plan, templates that are available for you to deploy, deploy quickly, um, who you're go talking to your PEI PIO, making sure your PIO knows about these. Um, the templates are great because um, you can just sort of modify them a little bit and get them out there quickly. The idea is you want to respond quickly. So you want your positive message of hope and your help to go quickly and keep pushing it out. So if you have those templates ready in your communication plan, you can more effectively do that. And that includes having a plan to work with the media. There's lots of resources around that. If there's getting, if a lot of media coverage is happening, um, you want to be, you may want to be ready within your agency for how you might respond to um, a, a call from a media representative. You may even have a more proactive strategy for how you reach out to the media to respond to their coverage. You may also, within schools, want to collaborate with what your response will be. So if you've got those established relationships with your local police department and fire department, that's a perfect opportunity to do a joint press release if it requires that. If there's a lot of media attention, you want to make sure that, number one, you're consistent. Secondly, that you're not violating any confidentiality, but that the minute there's a discrepancy, then folks are going to begin to focus on that and then there's that lack of trust. So it's important as you message that there is accurate messaging, but that there's consistent messaging. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And as you alluded to before, this, your communication plan is also, you know, you'll have your templates for how to deal with different situations. So it's, it's um, you know, suicide is complex. So afterward, you might not have um, verification of the cause of death from the coroner. That can take a while. Um, or you might have a family who is, um, has made it clear from the beginning that they don't wish this to be known. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not just within schools, but in other places as well. Um, I'm from Senator Portentino's office, and our district has a pretty um, diverse communities, um, Asian American communities as well as Hispanic communities. And oftentimes those communities um, don't get enough information because of the language barriers um, and I know that some of our school districts are working really hard to communicate with those parent groups but um, most districts don't really have that plan mm -hmm. so I think it is really important to be mindful of um, some of those communities that might not get in enough mm -hmm. information um, and be a part of that prevention. Um, I've noticed that um, most districts have different parent groups um, for example, La Cunada has a Korean American parents group. San Marino has a Chinese um, parents group. And they have their own resources and they have their own communication plan. So um, if one or two school officials and um, some of the ad administrative staff members can reach out to those um, smaller parents groups, I think it'll be really nice to um, disseminate the information yeah. to parents. So we're going to hold off on questions if we can, um, since we're running short of time and we want to be respectful of your lunch. It's been a long yeah. morning. And then at the <laughs> end, true. or certainly this afternoon, we're available to ask addi answer additional questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so there are ways to develop communication templates that balance those things. You don't have to, to acknowledge that it was a suicide or determine that it was a suicide to acknowledge the fact that people are talking about it as though it was. We know suicide is being talked about right now. We want you to know this help is available. So some of the key principles of safe messaging are available in another workshop in great depth. I encourage you to go see that. Um, a little bit about after suicide that, that's sort of a slightly different. You, again, always providing resources, 
um, some kind of education about complicated grief. Many people who are experiencing this complicated grief don't always understand the degree to which what they're experiencing is, is kind of, that's part of the process. And it can cause additional distress if they feel like they're alone in this or the only one that's feeling like this. Avoiding details about the method or location always. Um, anytime we're talking about a communication plan, information sharing, we are not talking about you putting out the details about a death. Really, you're just acknowledging a death happened and then moving on to what you really want people to know, which is that the help is available. Uh, anything that oversimplifies the causes and the degree to which you can counter that kind of messaging. Um, we hear a lot of tight relationships between you know, suicide is caused by this, or they died because this happened to them. Um, and I think it's just our human nature. We want to know why, and it's, it's a very, it's, it's a painful thing. We want to know how could they have done this? Why did this happen? And anything that you can do to create a little simple algorithm in your mind might help you feel like you're a little more on top of things. But in fact, it's not that simple, ever. Bullying, being a veteran, that does not cause you to kill yourself. I know that um, they mentioned it in the, in the Name called Paul, but like with the Latino communities, a lot of the time when somebody does die by suicide, it's like a taboo and you don't want to talk about it. And I think mainly because of the religious aspect of it that, you know, they're going to hell or whatever. But the thing is that we need to open that up more and really get our families involved because they need to know, you know, the signs. I had a niece, I have a niece that is 10 and she cut herself. And, you know, thank God. She didn't die, but now she has resources that she can use because, you know, she still has those, those thoughts. So we do have to let our parents. Our Absolutely, parents, yeah. Because a lot of them don't even want to talk about it. Well, no, if we don't talk about it, maybe it'll go away. The faith community are huge advocates to keep kids safe. Yeah. And so that's yeah. what we have to begin yes. to look at is how do we as school systems of care provide that additional support. It can be non-denominational um, with no religious um, intent, but it's how do we keep our kids safe. So I know within Alhambra, we've convened about 30 different faith um, communities, and we have one big umbrella called Kingdom Causes. And it really advocates for that postvention, for that support. They've even provided monetary resources for burials and all the other variables, and then parent education and parent education facilities. So there's a lot of good that they're able to contribute. So we have to begin to have those dialogues. Yeah. Yes. I would suggest that, you know, if you're, if you're providing outreach to parents that you don't, you know, call your presentation the suicide prevention presentation Absolutely. in the Latino community yes. and, and, you know, ease it with, you know, uh, raising a child in challenging times. Yes. I mean, you know you're going to cover the important information right. on depression and suicide, uh, but you need to get them in the room yeah. first. Get them in the room, and, and again, after, after a suicide, um, there can be a lot of sensitivity around feeling blamed and guilty already, and if you go off and list your warning signs and leave it at that, people are going to feel like, I should have I seen it. You, know, you don't want to contribute to that message. So it's again, it's thinking about getting the resources out to help. We're watching out for each other now. We're taking, it, we're watch, we're taking care of each other now. This is how we do it. So um, to wrap up this part, just to go through, so your postvention response plan um, will have some basic steps. In all deaths, um, you receive the information one way or another, and then you establish and document the facts and circumstances to the degree you can as a core team member. Then you, uh, you mobilize and offer support. Um, again, you're communicating carefully. You have some templates to draw upon. You pull them out. You modify them. You disseminate them as, as quickly as you can. Uh, monitoring the impact on the community in any way that you can, and then determining if a broader community response is needed. Rather than just mobilizing support to those immediately impacted, may you need to do something broader um, if the person in, in the community, depending on the circumstances, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So again, the steps, mobilizing the support to survivors, you coordinate with the first responders, um, figure out who the immediate survivors are and the witnesses, um, getting support to that person, either by cold calling, literally cold calling, reaching out to them, um, making, did law enforcement, did you give them the brochures, did they have the card, 
and then continuing this outreach over points in time. So um, it can be weeks, months, a year later before the, it's the right time to receive that information. So maybe you have a plan for how you're going to check in with, with the people who are impacted over time. Maybe an anniversary, um, the first holiday after it. There's lots of different points and opportunities. Um, sharing the communication template, templates, so you have them, uh, you have your templates, you share them with the agencies who might be looking for how am I supposed to communicate about this. I want to send a memo out or I want to send an email out. Do you have something I can use? Um, reducing the risk of contagion, again, that's the monitoring step. So you're monitoring how the community uh, that you're serving is responding. This can include whether memorials are happening, what those look like, what, what's being said on social media, what the students are talking about in the school, what the workers are talking about, where the person worked. Um, and again, you're disseminating your messages of help and hope through your communication templates, any venues that you, you have at your disposal, sharing the resources that are available to help. And in working with the different key partners in the community over time, how are people doing where you are? What, how can we get help to them? So there are some circumstances where a broader response is indicated in a community. Um, sometimes if it happened in a public place, um, especially if there were witnesses, if it was a well-known person in the community, just someone influential who a lot of people knew, um, or a lot of people within a particular community knew, a high school coach, something like that. Subject of extensive media or social media coverage, um, homicide, suicide is a common example of that. It'll get a ton of coverage um, so you know that people are being really widely impacted by it and the response after a homicide, suicide is also very complicated, but some of these same principles apply. And then if one, more than one suicide occurs in an unusually short amount of time and try and let that be a data-driven thing. So, as your core team, you know kind of what your trends are in your community, so you're going to know factually whether this is unusual and then respond appropriately. Um, and so, yeah, any of those might merit this community response. This might be some kind of a public meeting or a forum issuing some kind of a public statement. In some smaller communities in particular, it's gotten to a point where they've issued a public health alert around the issue. Um, monitoring and responding to media coverage, Again, always disseminating your materials in every way you can, electronically, um, paper copies. And then in some cases, targeted responses can be helpful when the death is going to really dis is disproportionately impacting a certain community. So maybe in a senior living facility, you've had a couple of suicide deaths in an unusually short amount of time. So maybe you want to mobilize some kind of a targeted response to those communities. And if you do, so holding community events after suicide, just a couple of considerations for that. Sometimes um, you're doing this as part of your postvention response. You have determined there is a risk here. You need a broader community response. You want to hold some kind of a big community event. Um, or in other cases, it could be like my poor colleague who's trying to do outreach this coming suicide prevention week. Um, you have all kinds of events planned. You're not going to cancel them, but you have to consider how to go forward with those in the aftermath of this event. And with schools, if you're looking at memorials and what your position or decision is and looking at the needs of the students and the climate, you still want to bring in your outside resources, your agencies, your police department, because if they're all going to go to a park, for instance, you want the kids to remain safe and you want the participants to remain safe. So that's where those relationships and that collaboration would continue. Absolutely. So um, things you can do in those community events, um, it, you know, it, you know, you really be clear on the purpose of your event. Make sure that you have resources, um, that you're sharing information about resources to people who attend. Um, you may want to have, as we do here, a quiet room and the availability of counselors for people to speak with. It can be a courtesy to reach out to the, um, the people who have had the recent loss and give them a heads up, this is happening. Um, and then, of course, looking at what you're presenting, looking at what's involved in your event. How can we make sure this is not inadvertently issuing a message of blame? And then training, so suicide prevention, let's have a training is a, a common response, but it may not be the right time to have a suicide prevention training. Again, unless you have this targeted thing, you're really concerned about contagion in this particular environment, you want to get training to some of the people who are gatekeepers in that environment. But again, it's part of a strategic process. And then again, linking your postvention to prevention. Postvention, we've talked about reducing contagion and mobilizing support. This is all about prevention. Prevention of further tragedy. Prevention of further distress. 
So there are also, um, your, your um, core team can also feed back a lot of the specifics about the postvention response to the Suicide Prevention Coalition who's doing that community-wide strategic planning. And now I'm going to, Laurel's going to talk more specifically so about how, the school How do we work with our school staff and how do we work to support students? And we have to look at, you know, our place of business is very different than the clinical world or outside the school. And so we have to look at what are the immediate student needs. And I know somebody earlier talked about the length of time of recovery in response. And we have to look at how do we help schools recover to the point where they get back to business as usual to the extent that that's possible. And then where do we go for that aftercare support? So being thoughtful being respectful you know I heard this morning and pay me to hear that that same empty chair sat for how many months in that classroom after the loss by suicide and so really as you look at your postvention who's going to go and work with the teacher to configure who's going to work to respectfully take down the memorial and perhaps be able to bring them over to the family's home and really look at the process and is that climate at the schools ready for that process and being able to make sure that others are involved so it's not just the adults making that decision but perhaps you have a real safe dialogue with some of those students that are most immediately impacted or really take a position on that and so are we to blame we already know the answer of course not um, but do we have the opportunity to be able to prevent we do you know we want to build those resiliency skills we want to build and increase those protective factors we want to look at those youth that are most vulnerable we want to make sure that we have those gatekeepers and many of you have heard me say we need more kid detectors not metal detectors because that's what keeps our kids safe we need to make sure that kids trust and have reliable adults that they can trust that we say by name where do you go for help that we make sure that we are able to message this continuously from day one when they step onto our campuses all the way through and that you know those crisis hotlines are available not just in the aftermath of a death by suicide but throughout the school year and on the weekends and on those long holidays because we have had so many circumstances in which a student has emailed a counselor fortunately there's a process in place and so we're able to send, send out a welfare call but if not what would have happened and so you want to make sure that as you're looking at your postvention there's a huge prevention piece in that as well and then dues of postvention, and we've gone through this and we'll just kind of click through, but as you're providing postvention and you look at what you're going to create in your school community, that you make sure on every campus that you've got a room that you're able to deliver those services, that it's a room that's private, that you're able to close down a library or perhaps a student center so that you're able to convene your crisis response team, that you make sure that you're focusing on the main issues, that you make sure that you're not just focusing on those directly involved, but you're looking at the broad broader picture that you're checking in with not only students but staff and remember staff goes throughout the day so you've got walk-on coaches and staff you've got night custodial crew you're looking at the whole gamut there because if we just focus on that day piece we're missing a lot of individuals and then we look at you know what we can do to support ongoing care because we know that those kids that are impacted directly or indirectly are at a higher risk level and so we want to make sure that we're continuously talking about this and messaging this and be patient. Yeah. Um, that goes without saying. <laughs> that was a saying. good one. <laughs> you know, that, that's one that you need every day you step onto those campuses. Um, and so we're going to wrap up because I, I see the hook out there. Um, but the oh. don'ts, these are pretty common don'ts, but it's important to be mindful of those. Um, you know, we're in the business of taking care, and so we want to make sure that we continue to take care. And that, again, if we're not quite sure what to say, perhaps we just sit and listen. And so you don't always have to have that response in that statement. And your multidisciplinary teams, when you say, well, the budgets are tight and it's not written in my LCAP plan and it's not part of my school safety plan, look at your resources. You already have multidisciplinary teams in your campuses. You've got your SST, your student study teams. You've got IEPs, although you know, they're not just associated with that, but they've got school psychologists involved. You've got um, school-based mental health services through the Department of Mental Health. There are a lot of resources. We just have to be creative. We have to think outside the box so we can build capacity. Build relationships with those DMH teams. When we had a crisis, they would call by numbers and they say, how many clinicians do you need? So that way we didn't have to pull folks from all the other schools that we were able to make sure we maintained some control on all campuses, not just the campus where the need was. And then, you know, strategies for schools. We encourage staff to be direct. 
you know, to begin to really ask those tough questions and to have those dialogues, to be persistent. You know, I often say to staff, if your gut tells you something's not right, chances are it's not right. And so you don't have to do it alone. You know, you want to make sure you've got partners. You want to make sure you have colleagues. You want to make sure you communicate with administration. If you're the direct service providers, that communication is critically important. And then where to go to get help. And there's a lot of resources in LA County, and we know there's tremendous resources. Access and use those resources. And that's part of the beauty of this, is we're really working hard to collaborate both the educational and the community res resources and the availability through Department of Mental Health and all the other resources available. And so reaching out to students, um, you know, as we wrap up this morning, um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can reach out to students, because kids are going to say, I'm fine. I don't want to talk or I'm only going to talk with my friends because there's that code of silence. And that's where you've got to begin those dialogues well before there's a critical incident. You need to begin to identify those reliable adults. Our kids need these adults to deal with these complicated matters. And so we want to make sure that we create a climate of care. And you know, your LCAP surveys on all your schools require to look at school climate, student engagement, parent engagement. This all <laughs> creates safety. And not just safety for that intruder, that's safety for kids keeping safe day to day. <coughs> in memorials, you know, when I started in this business of looking at mental health 12 years ago, we said, absolutely not. You're not going to have a memorial. It's going to create a contagion. We're very different now. You have to look at what the needs are, what the requests of the students. Is the climate and community ready for that? Can we handle that? We've created memorials and where our police officers have come out of uniform to the services or to the park because we didn't want that formality there. So we want to be really thoughtful and really sensitive. And that's why these dialogues, these partnerships are so critically important well before you may need to call upon this support. And so you really want to look at, and it's a case by case, there's no right answer for every single specific circumstance. You have to look at it very individually because every situation is a completely different event. So with that, it's a lot of information know, in a very right? short Gosh. period of time. I'm sure we answered all your questions. So you'll go back and create that postvention. But we do have our contact information. Um, so I think it's on the next slide. Sandra's slipping there. Okay, and um, you're welcome to reach out to us. We can share what our resources are. We'll be here throughout the day if there's any additional questions. Look at your crisis response plans for schools. Look at your community response plans um, because together we can be so much better. Yeah. And so that's really what we're trying to impress upon all of you. And yeah. thank you. Yeah, please take the handouts too. We have um, some, some of the summary of the community postvention tips and we have our resources compiled. Yes. And um, if uh, we have a school postvention checklist, and I have a couple of these community postvention guys for anyone who's deadly serious about doing this work. So thank you. Thank you.